how to knit fair isle hi everyone my name is norman and today's video is all about fair isle knitting this is an ingenious knitting technique that allows you to knit with multiple colors and create stunning patterns it can be knitted flat or in the round with two colors or even three knitting fair isle is super simple but if you don't pay attention, your finished project may be colorful, but possibly not stretchy enough or without a neat stitch definition. And that is why the second half of this video will cover a lot of stranded knitting tips and tricks. So let's dive right into it and show you how to knit Fair Isle the continental way. And of course, like this video right now to support my work. At its core, fair isle knitting is simple in the extreme. If you know how to knit the knit stitch, then you already know how to knit fair isle. It's as simple as knitting three stitches in one color and then picking up a second color and knitting another three stitches. Drop that yarn, pick up the other color and knit three stitches or however many you like. Drop that yarn, pick up the other color and knit another three stitches. So basically you are dragging the unused yarn along as you knit and this will create so-called floats here on the backside. As a result, fair isle knitting is typically regarded as a non-reversible fabric. Of course, all this dropping and picking up the yarn is a bit cumbersome. That's why smart knitters have invented ways to knit fair isle with both strands held together. So, pick up both strands like this. Well, I always do it like this but there are other ways to tension the yarn as well. I wrap it around the pinky finger and then I pick up one strand and flip it around, flip it around. Let's do that one more time. So once around the pinky finger across the back of your hand and then flip one strand around and now you end up with two separate threads here around your index finger and now you can continue knitting the way I just showed you. So you knit two stitches here using the blue yarn and then you cross the blue yarn and knit two with the green. Two with the blue yarn and two, oops, two with the green. It's really as simple as that. And of course you can knit however many stitches you like, doesn't have to be two. Now you might notice that this still feels a bit awkward, especially if you are using a fuzzy yarn. So most continental knitters will use a so-called knitting thimble to knit fair isle. I'll put a link in the description below in case you want to buy one. It's like one or two dollars. Over the past couple of months, a lot of people asked me how to use one and it's really super, super simple. So you put it on like a ring and then you pick up your first color and you thread that color through this left eyelet like this. Let's do that one more time like this. And then you pick up your second color and thread it through the second eyelet like this, coming in from behind like so. Let's do that one more time, like so. And then you can pick up your work and tension those two strands held together any way you like. I always wrap it around the pinky finger once. And from here, make sure everything is nice and tight and from here we can start knitting the way we did before. So we are going to knit two stitches here in the blue yarn and maybe two, let's do three in green, maybe just one in blue, two in green and so on. It's as simple as that or is it? 
Well, it's time to start talking about a couple of very important rules because if you were to knit like this, then chances are pretty high your finished project would probably look well, let's call it charmingly self-made. Let's take a look at the wrong side. And as you can see, the unused yarn gets dragged along here on the wrong side and creates these little floats. And it's very important to keep these floats long enough so they don't constrict your knitting, but also not too long uh, so the stitches will come loose. Here is what you need to do. So whenever you change colors, knit one stitch in the new color and then stretch out these stitches here on the right needle. Then continue knitting in this color then switch colors and knit one stitch and again stretch out these stitches. Knit across, switch colors and stretch these stitches out. Never ever bunch up these stitches here on the right needle. Always take your time and stretch these stitches out as far as possible because otherwise you will mess up these floats on the wrong side. And if you are working with a rather fuzzy yarn, you might really, you know, give it a good yank like this. And that is also the reason why you may see a lot of fair isle knitters knitting a very stretched out like this. So they are not knitting, uh, knitting like, uh, like this, like this. But everything is really stretched out and stressed. So these floats here on the back side get all the room they need to breathe. So uh, with a little bit of practice, you don't need to yank all the time, but still it is quite important to do so ever so often because um, you want these floats to really settle in. Now the next problem regarding these floats has to do with tension as well. In traditional fair isle you would never bridge more than four stitches or five maximum uh, because otherwise the floats will be too long and this will mess up your tension. To avoid this problem you need to anchor these floats every four stitches and this is done by trapping the unused color in between the working yarn and the knitting needle. Some will do it every five or even six stitches, some don't do it at all. It will depend a bit on the yarn you are using and your individual preferences. So how do you catch a float in continental knitting when using a knitting thimble? Well, you have three options. If you need to catch a float in the dominant color, so the color here on the left, then things are fairly easy. So instead of knitting the next stitch like this, you come in here from the left and catch the yarn like this. And then for the next stitch you come in from the outside again and that's already it. Stretch out and continue knitting. Let's do that one more time. So you come in here from the left, pull the yarn through, and then for the next stitch here from the right, stretch things out and that's already it. One last time in slow motion. And if you catch your floats like this, you end up with these bumps every couple of stitches that secure your floats. If you need to catch a float of the background color, so the blue color in this case, then things are a bit more difficult. In this case, you have to go all the way around and catch the yarn from here. And then knit one more stitch. Let's do that one more time. So all the way around like this and you will notice that this typically doesn't work very well. 
So instead, you can also catch the yarn like this or the float like this. So you go around, but then you wrap the yarn around the working needle clockwise and then you pull through. Of course, then you will end up with a twisted stitch. You will have to untwist in the next round by knitting it through the back loop, but it will be a bit easier. So let's do that one more time. So around and clockwise, and then you pull through and then you can continue knitting. Now, I am not going to lie to you. Uh, even catching the yarn like this will be somewhat awkward. And that is why you will typically try to avoid having to catch uh, loads in the second color as much as possible by switching the colors uh, around as needed. Knitting for aisle in the round. Everything I showed you so far applies to knitting for aisle in the round. I used straight needles so it's easier to see the backside and there is not a set of five DPNs crowding the picture. Still, with the basics you can finish beautiful hats, socks or sweaters, but there's only one more thing you need to remember. Mind the gap. So you knit across just the way I showed you before. There is no difference whatsoever. But as you bridge the gap here, you and you start knitting with the new color. You risk creating a float that is too short. That's because the rest of the fabric here is sitting on the previous needle, needle and it's angled. It's not straight, but angled. So after the first stitch in the new color, you absolutely need to bring these needles straight and stretch things out. Then knit one more stitch and possibly stretch things out one more time. So otherwise you will mess up your uh, stitch definition beyond redemption. So let's, let me get to the next gap to show it to you one more time. So when you bridge the gap, now here I'm not creating any float, so I don't need to do anything special. But as I start with the new color here now, now I need to stretch things out and then knit the next stitch and keep things loose. And you know, I guess this is just one out of a million reasons why it's so important to knit in the round on a set of five needles. You can't really do this with just four needles. And if you have uh, a long float like bridging five, six, seven, eight stitches, then consider catching the float before you bridge the gap or shuffle stitches around. And if you do it like this and stretch out the stitches, whenever you bridge a gap, you will end up with nice and even floats here on the back side with, you know, no ladder or visible fold line or any puckering here on the right side. Still, I would personally say that you should try to use circular needles whenever possible and knit in one continuous round to avoid this problem. So not magic loop, one continuous round. Because here's the thing, only one messed up float is enough to constrict your whole fabric. Let me fake this. So let me mess up this float here. So make this shorter. And already you can see how the fabric is puckering. So basically this means when you are knitting socks for aisle socks or so, when you mess up once out of, I don't know, 10,000 stitches, you already messed up your fabric. So try to stick to circular needles whenever possible. A lot of you have asked me if you can knit Fair Isle flat and seemingly that is everything I did so far, right? Well, not exactly. I never showed you how to knit across the backside. 
Traditionally, you knit it in the round for a couple of reasons. One of them is probably connected to the fact that a lot of English knitters hate purling. The other reason is, of course, that standard file fabric curls like madness because all these floats here on the backside add tension to an already tensioned fabric. So it's not the, not exactly the ideal fabric for a scarf, at least not when you knit it flat. On top of that, it's very difficult to read your knitting because all these floats here obstruct the view. So I would actually argue that it's easier to learn knitting in the round than forcing you to knit file flat. I'll link you to my full tutorial on how to knit in the round up in here. But for various reasons you may want to knit it flat and then there are only two adjustments you need to make. So obviously as you knit across the backside you need to purl all stitches but as you can see it's more or less the same technique so nothing really difficult here. You pick the yarn from the front or from the back. So this part is super simple. What may be a bit more difficult is the way you catch floats. So let's suppose I want to catch this yarn here. In this case, I need to go around and purl it like this. And then I can continue purling. Let me show you that one more time. So I go around, grab the yarn from here, and then I can continue purling, maybe stretch that out. If I want to catch a float of the green yarn, I have to do it like this. So I go all the way around and purl like this and then I come in from the front again. Let's show that to you one more time. So I go around and purl like this. And then I continue purling. Easy as that. The second thing you need to consider is the edge. No matter which color you end a row with, you always need to twist the yarns. Because if you turn around like this, what will happen is as you knit across and start with this color, it will lift this stitch upwards and create a visible hole. And if you twist the yarns like this and start your row with the yarn twisted. You anchor this blue yarn here in the edge. Let me knit one more stitch here. You anchor this stitch here and the blue yarn comes out of the edge and can't drag this stitch upwards. Now, I want to be honest with you, if you twist the yarns like this, it will not exactly create a pretty edge. If you seam things well, it doesn't really matter. However, if you want to use this project flat, then absolutely consider doing a double knitting selvage of three, four, five stitches or however many you think looks pretty. As an alternative, you can also knit the first or the first two stitches with two strands held together. For example, when you are knitting a in the round a swatch flat or so, this can help to anchor the floats. And here's one last tip for advanced knitters. Um, just like purl and knit stitches or mirror images, your yarn dominance will be mirrored as well. So you actually might have to switch colors here on the backside, but more on that later. Part two, file tips and tricks. Now that we covered the basics, it's time to address some tips and tricks. As I said, the technique itself is super simple, but perfecting it may be not. And here is a little note. If you like this tutorial so far, consider supporting me on Patreon. 
Each little contribution helps me producing more comprehensive and free resources like these. Plus, I will share some advanced color work techniques and tips for my subscribers very soon. For the sake of brevity, I couldn't include many of the more advanced tips here in this video. It's already long enough as it is. Either way, the first issue we have to talk about is tension. And this has been the single most asked question in a recent poll here in the community tab of my YouTube channel. Things like my tension is always off, my fabric isn't stretchy, it puckers, how do I fix things? And quite honestly, it's very easy and at the same time super complicated. So we need to talk a bit about knitting theory, otherwise this will not make any sense. The first thing you absolutely need to realize is that standard knitting and for aisle knitting don't create the same fabric. I mean, you are always dragging one color along or even more and this will create a much thicker fabric. Think of it like this. If you have a sheet of paper, it's pretty flexible. If you stack two sheets of paper on top of each other, well, it's quite a bit less flexible. And if you use three, well, it will pretty soon feel like cardboard. And for aisle knitting is exactly the same. You cannot expect it to behave like stockinette stitch, even though technically speaking it is. So when you transition from fair aisle to stockinette stitch or vice versa, you cannot simply continue knitting as if nothing changed. That's like putting a thin tart and a red velvet cake into the same oven and expecting them to be done after the same 30 minutes. Well, no. So in this case, I would have knitted the fair aisle section with five millimeter needles. And then I, as I transitioned to stockinette stitch, I would have gone down to 4.5 millimeter needles. And you probably may also have to tension your yarn a bit differently if you want to meet the gauge of the rest of your fabric. Take my example. Uh, when I'm for standard knitting, I typically wrap the yarn around my pinky finger two times and tension the yarn like this. But when I'm knitting for aisle, I typically only wrap the yarn around my pinky finger once. This will ensure I'm knitting with a looser tension. And also uh, the yarns obviously rub against each other and that creates further friction. So I don't need the extra second wrap. The problem with this technique is, however, when you are knitting a pattern where you don't use the colors in an equal way, one strand, so the unused strand, will quickly become too loose. That's because um, the working yarns will unwind at the same speed, but a stitch needs much more uh, yarn than a float. There are a couple of ways to prevent this. The first version is simply adjusting your tension ever so often by pulling on the tails. If you notice, well, things are getting a bit too loose, adjust your tension manually. The second way of holding the two colors in your hand is by just placing them in between your ring and pinky finger and knitting like this. For me, this kind of doesn't work, but maybe for you it does, because I'm used to holding my needles with all three fingers and then it doesn't work. So what I do instead is I weave the working yarns here through my fingers like this, well, like this. Whenever I'm knitting with a knitting thimble, I often also tension the yarn like this. So I only bring it uh, um, across my ring finger and then I can uh, clench my pinky and my ring finger so I can tension my yarn like this. This is a bit harder or more difficult to put on so it will feel very weird when you do this but it for me it kind of works. What you can also do is you can wrap one yarn around your index finger like this and then the second color you can wrap around your pinky finger just like normal and then knit like this. This too will keep the two strands separate to 
knit fair isle. And it's very important to note that I can't tell you what works for you. I can only show you alternative versions. What I can tell you that it is very important that you work on your a technique where the yarn can flow freely without getting tighter with each stitch, but where you don't end up with too much slack after two or three stitches. Practice this on a swatch until it feels about right. I know, I mean, you are kind of expecting me to present you with a super a solution, like hold the yarn in your hand like this. But in my opinion, things don't work like that. Now I can already see the comments coming that you can, of course, hold one yarn in each hand and do a continental knit stitch here with this hand and an English stitch here with this with the right hand and continue knitting fair isle by alternating between the two hands. I would caution you to try this for a couple of reasons. First of all, it really takes a lot of practice to switch knitting styles. So I wouldn't really do this for your first fair isle project. Knit a couple of pot holders and a scarf or two with English style or with continental style, whatever you need to learn until you are proficient. Otherwise, this really spells disaster. And the second thing you absolutely have to consider has to do with tension as well. I know very, very few knitters that can produce a swatch with the exact same gauge in English and in continental knitting. So if you are one of them, go ahead. There are quite a lot of tutorials here on YouTube that will show you how to catch float, etc. using both hands. And I know knitters that basically do nothing else but knitting for isle sweater as well. Then this really is your technique. But for the rest, I'm less convinced because at the end of the day, this will just make the issue of yarn dominance worse. So let's talk about that. So here's what you need to know about yarn dominance. When you are knitting fair isle, you always hold one yarn here on the left and one is placed on the right. And it doesn't matter if you are using a knitting thimble, you hold your yarn like this or um, one in each hand. One is always on the left side and one on the right side. Typically the dominant color, the color that defines your motive is on the left and typically the background color is on the right. And as a rule of thumb, this will create the best results, especially as catching floats will be much easier that way as well. But why are you doing it this way? Let's take a quick look at this practice swatch here. So for this row here, I held the, used the white yarn as my dominant color. So the one on the left and the blue as my background color. So the yarn on the right. And for this row, I did it exactly the opposite way and up in here the same. And if you compare these two rows, you can already see that these stitches are a tiny bit larger than these here. And up in here, it is even more obvious. Here, these Vs really pop, while these Vs here, they almost kind of recede back into the fabric. And that is what knitters mean when they are talking about yarn dominance. So whenever you start a fair isle pattern, ask yourself which stitches need to pop. And the way you should think about this is, if you were to draw your pattern using one color only, maybe like this, which color would you do the drawing with? And that is the color that should be your dominant color. And that is the color you should always carry uh, on the left as your dominant color. Now, sadly, there is a lot of nonsense floating around the internet concerning yarn dominance. And you even find it in a lot of books. A lot of uh, knitters say that's because the floats that end up on the bottom are longer than the floats that end up here on top. But that is of course not true at all. I will very soon publish an exclusive video on my Patreon account where I will explain this problem in greater detail, what causes it and how to fix things. For you as a beginner, the only thing you need to know is that there is a difference and that throughout a pattern, you should stick to keeping 
knitting the same color on the left and the same on the right. And if you're knitting socks or whatever, then for the second pair, you, you keep it that way. So the same color stays on the left and the same on the right. The only place where you need to pay attention is when you are knitting flat. Because everything is mirrored on the back side, the yarn dominance will be mirrored as well. So if you are knitting flat and you want to keep a consistent gauge and stitch definition, then you would have to switch things up. Knitting ribbings and other knit pearl combinations using the fair isle technique. A lot of people have asked me if you could only knit fair isle in stockinette stitch. Of course you can also use a stranded knitting to knit any other knitting stitch pattern, oops, knitting stitch pattern as well. In this case the only thing you need to remember is that the unused color always stays on the wrong side. If you are familiar with double knitting it's the exact same thing. So just like before you start by knitting two stitches. And now when you need to purl uh, these two in red, the blue color stays in the back and you only bring the red to the front and purl these two stitches. Then you bring the yarns to the back again and you knit two stitches. Then you bring only the red to the front and purl two stitches. Knit two and purl two. So once you get the hang of this it's actually rather simple. It only well, takes a little while to get used to that. And on the wrong side it's maybe a tiny little bit more difficult. So the blue stitches now I need to purl them. That's easy. All the yarns stay in the back and I purl them. But now I need to knit these red stitches here on the wrong side. And this means I only need to bring the red yarn to the back and keep the blue line yarn here. So I knit these two red stitches, bring all yarns to the back, purl two. And as you can see, I bring the red yarn to the back using my knitting needle. I kind of feel that is the easiest way to do so, but you can also do it with your fingers or any way you like. It's the only thing that is important that it, it that you separate the yarns just like you would for any other form of double knitting in two colors. So a lot of people have been asking me why the fabric lost all stretchiness. Again, Fair Isle creates no stretchy fabric. So in fact you don't want it to be stretchy because when you stretch the things out the floats here on the backside will become very visible and that's not pretty at all. And this is even more true when it comes to ribbing. So this corrugated ribbing will certainly look pretty on the right side. But you have to understand that in a standard rib stitch all stitches in a row are connected. So the fabric can breathe and stretch out. And because you create a little bit of extra slack when you transition from a knit to a purl stitch, the fabric is typically stretchier than plain stockinette stitch. Do the same with Fair Isle. Well then the length of these floats dictates the stretchiness. And since ribbing typically contracts on the needles before you block things and stretch these things out, these floats here are typically quite short. I mean you can sort of counterbalance this by stretching your fabric even further when you are knitting and pressing things later on. But ultimately it has to be understood that this is a pretty pattern but it will never create a stretchy fabric. If you want that you need to double knit ribbing so like this. It won't be as stretchy as standard ribbing but still a lot stretchier than fair isle ribbing. 
knitting file with three colors. So many of you have asked me how to knit file using three colors and if it's possible doing it the continental way. And of course it is. You will however need a knitting thimble with three slots or which is actually better use the traditional knitting thimble and carry two yarns here on the left side and one on the right side but that of course means you need to know how to knit English style. But for continental style, you can do it like this. So we knit one in purple, one in blue, and here one in green, one in blue, and maybe one in purple. What will be a bit more difficult is when you need to catch floats. So let's suppose we want to create a float because we want to carry the purple for another couple of stitches. So in this case, you would have to go all the way around. So all the way around, oops, all the way around to catch the purple yarn and then you knit it like this. And just like that, you catch a float. Now let's suppose you want to carry across this green yarn for a couple of more stitches and you need to create a float. In this case, things start to get really complicated. So this yarn here needs to cross the green yarn like this. So this is normal, but this blue yarn needs to come from the outside as well. So the only thing, the only feasible way to do this is doing it manually like this and then you knit one stitch and then for the next stitch you can separate those threads again and knit the next stitch using only the green yarn and that's the way you can do this. Of course this is very 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 awkward so I would try to avoid this at all costs. For the dominant color it isn't that difficult either so you need to go all the way around and catch the yarn the way I showed you before. Of course you end up with this twisted stitch you will have to knit through the back loop in the next round but this should be fairly easy to manage. I do however want to caution you there is a reason why traditional file won't use more than two colors per row. Setting the complexities aside and that this cotton yarn is probably the worst choice ever for doing file with three colors you will create an even thicker and stiffer fabric. So uh, sticking to the example from before now we are at three sheets of paper and cardboard level. So even if you just do this out of a uh, one out of every ten rows this one row will dictate the stretchiness of the rest of your fabric. Kind of like the weak link of a chain, it will cinch things and you can already see this happening here. And of course, um, you know, advanced knitters may do this, but you will have to go one, uh, go up one needle, one more needle size, uh, probably change your tensioning method. And of course, yarn dominance will be an even worse problem. And so as a beginner, I would stay away from it. But that this doesn't mean you have to knit file with only two colors. Of course, you can introduce a new color at the beginning of every row. And then for example, knit across this row only with the green and the purple yarn. And in the next uh, right side row, you would only knit with the purple and the blue yarn and then switch back to green and blue. So there are a lot of choices. You don't have to knit with three colors per row. So let's talk about the best yarn for fair isle knitting. This is another important topic. In fact, probably the most important topic. I have a full tutorial on picking colors and yarn weights here on YouTube. So I'm not going to repeat all those 30 minutes here. But if you need to catch up, I'll link you to my full tutorial up in here. Instead, I want to focus on two other aspects. First of all, Fair Isle or any other form of stranded knitting or color work largely relies on the fact that the legs of two knit stitches forming this famous V here 
how it would ever is hi hidden uh, beneath it. So the strands here connecting to knit stitches and of course the floats. If you were to knit lace with a ton of eyelets, I tried to do this here. Here is an eyelet, here is an eyelet, and here is an eyelet. Of course, the strands uh, you carried across would peek through, and that's probably not what you want. To assure this, it's very important that you pick a yarn that will bloom a bit after the first wash. So if possible, try to get a woolen spun instead of a worsted spun yarn. You want something that fills these gaps and hides whatever is hidden below. And the second thing you need to focus on is picking a slightly fuzzy yarn. So it doesn't have to be as rustic as this one here, but at the end of the day, only the friction of the yarn prevents any stitch from stealing yarn from the floats. So the surrounding stitches create friction and this kind of locks uh, stitches in place. But if you use a slick cotton yarn like this one here and bridge 10 stitches, then there's nothing that keeps that stitch from vanishing into the fabric or becoming very large. The third thing you need to consider is that the larger your gauge, meaning the less stitches per inch you have, the less intricate your design will be. Here I used one, two, three, four, five, six stitches to knit these diamonds and you know, it's pretty, but still kind of crude. So as a rule of thumb, I would pick a slightly fussy sheep wool yarn that is ideally speaking woolen spun. And I would try to knit with a relatively small gauge. So for a small object, this means fingering weight and for a sweater or so something like DK. This will ensure that all the little flaws will of the technique are safely hidden out of uh, sight and you still have enough stitches on your uh, needle to really flesh out the design you have in mind. I also quickly want to talk about Fair Isle charts. I have a full tutorial on how to read charts here on YouTube. I'll link it to you up in here. But as far as Fair Isle is concerned, things are remarkably simple and there's nothing to be scared of. So I have this little chart here and each little box represents one stitch. And the way you should think of it is that this here is just a different way of writing. So I could also turn this first row into knit, comma, knit, comma, knit. And then I have knit, comma, knit. Or I write it like this. I make a little dot, comma, dot, comma, dot. And then three stitches in red. Or I make it like this. And there you have your chart. So it is not a chart, it is just condensed writing. Each row of the chart shows you one row of knitting. So you can simply use a little post-it or so and follow these boxes. Two stitches in blue, one, two, three in white, one, two, three in blue. And just like you knit from right to left, you also read the chart from right to left. So you can tell at a glance if these pictures, and that's what it really is, match. And once you are finished with one row, you move the post-it up one row and follow the next row. It's as easy as that. Now there are two things you need to know, two things only. Some charts only depict a repeat. This is often indicated by red or accented lines. And in this case, you have to repeat whatever is highlighted until the end of the row or round before you move up one level. So in this case, you would have to knit two blue, three white, and then two blue, three white, two blue, three white, and so on until the end of the row. And then you can move up one level and follow this repeat. 
The second thing you need to know is that when you are knitting flat, you have to read the wrong side from left to right. So right side from right to left and then left to right. So if your chart has numbers here on the left side, typically this indicates all the wrong side rows and it means this is a flat project. This might you know, sound a bit confusing, but it is done so you can look at your finish knitting from the right side and you know compare these two pictures and then you can pick this stitch here and see ah it is meant to be here okay there is no mistake so especially when you're knitting fair isle in the round it really boils down to comparing two pictures the one you are creating through your knitting and the one that is depicted on your chart it has nothing to do with mathematical charts it's just a picture and if you can look at a picture you can read a chart for Fair Isle. It's really that simple. Here at the very end I want to add two more thoughts. First of all if you are struggling with Fair Isle and you just can't seem to get it right give it a bit of time. This technique will need a bit of patience and practice just like any other attempt to change your tensioning method because that is what Fair Isle essentially boils down to. I mean you're knitting the knit stitch, you know how to knit the knit stitch. What is difficult is getting accustomed to the new tensioning method. And the second thing, learn to live with the limitations of traditional Fair Isle. This means Two colors per row don't bridge more than five stitches. In my opinion, Fair Isle is a technique best reserved for geometric designs like this here. If you want to paint pictures, then by all means, please consider doing it with Intaja. That way nothing puckers and everything remains stretchy. And in that spirit, I hope I was able to introduce you to the wonderful world of stranded knitting. Please like this video if you enjoyed watching, comment with your question and your feedback and consider supporting me on Patreon. Help me record more videos like this one here. I see it a bit like an honesty box. I try to provide very detailed tutorials for everyone in the hope that those who can afford it will leave a little donation. Either way, happy knitting and enjoy the rest of your day.